Okay, it says I see the little live button today. So um, I'm going to we are live. All righty. Thanks a lot, Alyssa. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome again to one of our uh, night sky tours with CTC astronomer Warren Hart. Wave hi, Warren. <laughs> He's so busy. <laughs> well, we are going to be talking about um, what month are we in? We're going to be talking about February's um, night sky and mm -hmm. what you'll be able to see without a telescope. And um, he's going to be going through a whole bunch of other nifty fun stuff. And so I'm going to go ahead and let Warren take it away. All right, great. Good to have everyone here. Uh, can't see all of you, but uh, appreciate you checking in with us. And we will be talking about uh, next month, February, the astronomical events and included in that are the constellations and not just because february only has 28 days that there are fewer constellations but it just worked out that way and we will only have five for this month which will give us some time at the end of <clears throat> going through the calendar there's an additional thing that i want to share with you to help you get yourself oriented in the sky. And uh, Cindy, if you want to pull up uh, the lib guide and just remind them or whatever on how to find all of this, sure. and I'll let you talk, uh, uh, tell them. And also look down at our time left to the event. In three more days, it'll only be 800 days to go. Oh, we're, yeah, that's true. I hadn't been watching it. So um, if you guys are following along with us, and hopefully Alyssa will put the um, LibGuide link in the comment section. But if you are trying to find this LibGuide, then you can go to the library website and go all the way down to research study guides. And at that point, you can click Astronomy and Mayburn Science Theater, and you will find the LibGuide. And it's got all kind of nifty stuff. Of course, it's got astronomy books with a library, uh, databases, films, uh, some internet resources, citation resources. But this is where you find our Mayburn Science Theater information. Um, there are links to what's going on at the planetarium and um, a lot of other information, the shows, and this is where you're going to find your night sky calendars. And this is what we work from, our constellation maps and our night sky calendars. And we'll show you later our fun activities. But for now, um, I am ready. Warren, oh, with your okay. first calendar. Okay, this is, as you can tell on there, the end of January, uh, all of February, and when we get to the second page, you will see a little bit of March. So let's take a look uh, here. And this is coming up, uh, as you see, the end of uh, January for the calendar there on the 30th and the 31st. And for those who were with us last month, January was just as we would use to say, chock full of uh, unique things that uh, have been happening in the month. And look on the 30th there, we have the uh, closest, uh, the perigee moon, but it happens to be the second perigee moon of, of January and uh, that's relatively rare and also if you add on the monday of next week then you see that we have a new moon and that's the second new moon also in january and uh, you can as cindy said on our the uh, library lib guide page and where the calendars are you can click on january itself and you'll see uh, other things that have uh, that have occurred. 
So let's get on and let's take a look in for February next Tuesday. And you see on there uh, posted that we'll post on the answers to the January puzzles. And there will be new, the new February puzzles will also be published and posted uh, that day. And there's your link down there. And uh, you can go to that and uh, be able to go right to that that section. I can show them really quick. Okay, go like ahead. We have what plenty we're of talking time. about with the puzzles. Mm -hmm. It's on our fun activities page, and every month Warren um, makes a crypto quote, astronomy related crypto quote. Crypto quote. Help me, Warren. Yes, That's right. A drop. Crop Quote. Astronomy yes. drop quote, yeah. And is it Sudoku? And astronomy Sudoku. All all the puzzles, the answer that you come up with is astronomy related. We're not going to be talking something completely different, the price of whatever or some other thing. So I'm keeping it to, tied in with astronomy. And uh, also it's usually pretty well it's tied in with something in January so and, have fun and, and and um you can upload your answer here uh, take a picture and upload the picture here and let's see the person with the most correct answers wins a prize and the winner will be announced on May 25th uh you you have to send in though that month <laughs> like because we do post the answers by the end of the month so don't send us the ones we've already put the answers to but um yeah good luck in that so okay good okay yeah fine so let's look also on tuesday february the first there at the bottom of the the block for february first there is the first of our five constellations that will be the best time of the year to observe these different ones. And the first one is the constellation called Carina. And if you notice, it's uh, other name is what it is. It's the keel, K-W-E-L, of uh, the ship uh, Argo Navis, which is an old uh, mythological uh, ship in uh, Greek history. I believe it is, and uh, it was a very, very large constellation, but it was decided a number of years ago by the professional astronomers to break it apart, and there are actually three uh, different parts of it, and this is one of them. So, Cindy, let's go ahead and let them see, and there you see Karina, and uh, also, I include on there, if you want to state, yeah, there it is, uh, how to pronounce it, Carina, and then the Latin uh, format of it, Carine. And uh, there is also another piece of information, that white area on that chart is the region, the spherical region in the sky, the astronomers have designated is what the region will be called Carina or Carina. And uh, that region in comparison with the others, it's the third brightest one with all the objects that are in there. There's many more, but I've only selected primarily what we can see with our visible with our eyeballs and no binoculars no telescope but if you have them go ahead and use them and its size its area it's 33rd out of uh, all the 89 areas now if you notice i have in red there something that looks like an x kind of laying on its side but it's actually another cross. And uh, Cindy, let's uh, scroll down to the information page. 
will actually go on down and right there and you see under asterisms the second thing down there it says the false cross and i um, point out do not use that cross to navigate with in the southern hemisphere because uh, you will get as navigators say we never get lost we get misoriented misoriented but we never get lost but if you use the false cross you are going to get lost so let's go back up to the uh, first page again and we see there it's pointing in the wrong direction to tell you how, where the South Pole is. You can pretty well tell where the South Pole would be. It's straight south there on down below uh, the word Kamalayan and uh, in between the eighth and the ninth hour uh, on there. And it would be down just a little bit below the chart. And if you're trying to orient to uh, using the South Pole and the Southern uh, Polaris there, uh, which would be uh, uh, the one that they would use. Polaris, uh, what we use in the Northern Hemisphere is Latin name and all it means is pole star. And if you wanted to give it a uh, proper name, it would be Polaris, uh, let's see, uh, the uh, uh, Northern Lights are the Borealis, Aurora Borealis, so this would be Polaris Borealis, which means Northern Pol uh, Pole Star, and for the Southern would be Australis which would be the Southern Pol Polaris Australis. Anyway, uh, it's a large constellation, as you can tell there. Also, I have on there a, uh, a dashed uh, line showing how far south from here at the latitude of where we are <clears throat> for the uh, planetarium that you would be able to see to the south and everything that's below that brown dashed line, we're not going to see unless you happen to travel to the south. So uh, that's showing the limit of where you would be able, what you would be able to see. And if you see, uh, look there at the false cross, we could see the top two, but we cannot see the bottom two of them. And there's a predominant number of stars in Carina that are below that line. However, over to the right, the first one, the big black dot, and the size of the black dots are in relation to uh, how bright they are. So if you'll scroll down just a little bit, Cindy, right there. And uh, there is the symbols on uh, the difference of how bright or its magnitude of an object in the sky. Now, the figured out there's probably not many, uh, another way you could indicate which is brighter than another one rather than just making a big black dot and using that relative size there to show uh, how, how uh, bright or dim it might be. So, uh, Karina, uh, we take a look at it there. And if we scroll back down on the second page, and if you stop, you notice uh, on that page, there is no information of the southern horizon. And the reason I have a second page without the horizon would be for people who want to uh, take this and uh, print it out, and they don't care uh, about uh, the planetarium's horizon area. They are somewhere else north or south of here, and so they still have the basic page, but they don't have the other line to bother them. 
And then let's look at the bottom page. Every constellation also will have a, a either a second or a third page, and there is the list of one through, as you see, down through 14 and the A, B, C, D, and all of those are related to the first or the second page with the numbering and the lettering there of what the objects are, their name, and other information there. Now, the uh, additional thing, notice below the asterism, the false cross, there are seven bordering constellations in a clockwise order starting at the 12 o'clock northern border. And so I've put them there. Uh, we start with Vela and then you go on around. And uh, there's the other piece of information. Interesting, one of the three constellations into which uh, the astronomer Lacal uh, divided the ancient constellation ship of the, of the ship Argonavis into uh, three. And if you want to view Carina, you have to be either at or between these two latitudes. Notice the northern latitude is south of us, which is only 14 degrees, 19 minutes north. We are at 31 degrees, one minute north. And so you would have to do uh, travel quite a ways down south to southern Mexico, probably, to be able to see all of Carina. So uh, that shows that. Let's go back up to the page, uh, either one of them. We can just do, and right there and up just a little. Now, uh, I said the bordering constellations, and I put that on there because I want to encourage you to learn more and get re, uh, familiar with different regions of, of the sky. So if you find, to help you find Carina, or you do find Carina, notice on the, the arrow up there at the top of the chart, where it says north, and the uh, section that it's in is in that constellation called Vela, and then going clockwise to your right, the next one is Pupus. You go scroll on around, there's Pictor, there's Volans, and if you scroll down just, there's Chameleon, and then Musca, and then Centaurus, and that would be the constellations that you would familiar, that border Carina. So what I encourage you is, uh, get you a constellation that you're able and to recognize and then get the sheet and print it out with the information about the bordering constellations. And what I encourage people is start with what you know in the sky and then make a do a spiral around it. Go all the way around what's right next to it. And then as you familiarize yourself with that, and then expand that spiral. Do not let the sky intimidate you. It's there for you to learn from, uh, become familiar with, to use, and enjoy. So that's Karina. Let's go back to the calendar. And by the way, if anyone has a question, either while I'm talking or coming up, Go ahead and you can then, uh, I guess on the chat, uh, uh, point, uh, write in, call in, whatever you do for your uh, question, and then it will get be sent to here and we can deal with it. Well, Wednesday is real busy. That's Groundhog Day. And uh, that's up in the somewhere else up in the, the northeast area. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, no major uh, uh, astronomical events that uh, just walking out to look. And then we come on Monday the 7th, and there's our second constellation. This is Cancer the Crab. Notice I also indicate on it as different than Carina, I say that it is an ecliptical 
constellation. Oh, well, let's go to Cancer the Crab, Cindy, and let's see if we can figure out why I call it a an ecliptical constellation. Notice the blue dashed line that goes across. That is called the ecliptic. And when I say that, if you're thinking astronomy kind of things, probably another word would come in mind, something like eclipse. And so along that line, that line is specifically the line of the path of our sun as we would observe it throughout the year. And there are, as a case here, you see cancer very definitely is in a, an ecliptical constellation. In other words, the ecliptic line uh, is include, goes across that area. Now, I've added some more here, and if you go up from the ecliptic, you see a purplish line, and that's the Tropic of Cancer. And uh, that is, when we'll see here in just a moment what that means. And then I go on up, and then I put in just for a reference, so you got an idea, that is uh, where our planetarium's latitude would be. So if you went out and to find Cancer the Crab, directly overhead would be where that, that line. So you would be looking directly overhead, the top part of Cancer. And if you looked at the south, it would come and you could then realize that because it's so close in that, that Cancer is going to be very, very high in the sky to find it. It's not down close to the equator. In fact, if you look and we scroll down a little bit, you see there's the equator, another line that goes across, and that's another brown line uh, that's on down there. Let's go to the second page, if you will. And uh, there's no planetarium latitude listed on that. So let's go to the third page. And the third page, here we have, there's again, all of our uh, information on the stars, the eight of them, and then the one uh, uh, cluster of uh, stars called the Beehive Cluster. Notice its, uh, its Latin name is Presepe, and that means manger. Now we go on down the asterism. There are your five bordering constellations as we go uh, down and see that. And the interesting information, I'll let you read that at a, another time if you want, but this gives you the background of what the Tropic of Cancer is uh, in the sky, or what it means, and uh, when was it kind of thought about on there. And then, of course, the latitudes of being able to observe it. So let's go back to the calendar. And we uh, finish up there on uh, the uh, Monday the 7th. Notice on both constellations, on February the 1st and on the 7th, I have the little uh, uh, additional little sentence in saying or uh, letting you know it's best to view it after sunset. And you can then look for it all through the night as long as you want until the next day's sunrise. So for Karina, you would go and you would see it on Monday or Tuesday night of, of uh, February the 1st. And then you would quit being able to see it because the sun is rising on Wednesday the 2nd. And the same thing relative for cancer there the that sunset to the next day then on the 8th we have our first uh, phase of uh, the moon to talk about and when we talk about a, a phase that is a part of time uh, a lengthy time period 
of what the moon is doing. The uh, first quarter moon is a precise time, 7.50 in the morning on Tuesday, and it's also a precise point in the sky. So uh, a quarter moon is not the phase. The phase is in between, uh, right after at 7.50 and starting in, uh, as it continues on in time, that's when you have a phase and it will continue what is called this waxing gibbous phase uh, there. And uh, what you, you have is that it's grow, getting more and more that you can see of the moon and uh, that will continue until the next one is going to be a full moon. And that, that time period between the two is the phase. The next one on uh, the, the ninth on Wednesday, uh, three in the morning is when uh, something called the equation of time. And that's the uh, relation of uh, where the sun would be at uh, high noon in relation to when you look on the what your time on your phone or on your watch reads and you will see that it the equation time is uh, 14 minutes after there because it's behind and i think we've got the chart on the libguide page and it's it relates to the fact that uh, as the Earth orbits the sun, the closer you get to the sun, the faster you move. The sun's gravity speeds up our orbit as we go around the sun real qu uh, much quicker than when we're far away from the sun, we slow down. So if we did not have a constant time period, we would have to reset our watch, everybody, every day to be in line with the sun. <clears throat> but if you want to be in line with the sun, then you can use a sundial. And that's what this would refer to. And then also of interest in early morning, uh, and it will continue on even down in the sunset uh, that evening, that the planet Venus will be its brightest magnitude. It'll be very, very bright uh, there, and you will have no problem identifying it in the sky. Now we go to Thursday the 10th, and here's our next uh, constellation, Pixis, the magnetic compass. And so let's go and take a look at that page, if you would, Cindy. Here it is. There, uh, there you see, there's the same information. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, notice that we have now the Tropic of, oh, Capricorn. That's in the Southern Hemisphere. And by the way, I didn't point it out in the other, but look at the little Delta, the Greek Delta, and it's a minus 23.44. Uh, degree south, and that just happens to be the angle, the tilt of Earth as we go around the sun. We are tilted 23.44 degrees, or I use it when I'm talking to people to learn about it. I say it's one, using your thumb, it's one uh, object, and uh, the Earth that is then your next four fingers, two, three, four, five. And so I just say it's 23.45 degrees. <clears throat> and because we're tilted, we do get seasons. If we were straight up and down as we orbited the sun, what you would have would be no season unless you travel to the north or you travel to the south. Wherever you would be on Earth 
would be the same uh, climate year round because there's no tilt, there's no change. And so uh, that's what that would be there. And there is Pixis. And uh, notice if we scroll down on the page, we are, we don't even have our uh, southern horizon on there. So we can see it. And let's scroll on down to page three or page two. And <clears throat> in there, uh, there's a, another, there's a statement on the Tropic of Capricorn, but look down at the, the latitudes to view all of the constellation Pixis. You must be at or between the latitude north of 52 degrees, 43 minutes north. Well, that's north of us. And that means we can see all of Pixis. We could not for Carina, as we saw that earlier. Okay, let's go back to the calendar and let's see what we have next. We have on that same Thursday, we have an apogee moon. And uh, apogee means that the moon in its orbit around the Earth is elliptical. It's not a constant distance from the Earth. There's a time when it gets close. And if you'll look back up on the calendar there on January the 30th, you see there's a perigee moon. And I always remember for myself as a memory thing that I think of perigee, I think perilous, that the moon is perilously closer to us in its orbit. And so perigee, and that means then apogee means it's farther from us. And you can also compare the miles between Earth and, and uh, the moon on both of them. Let's scroll on down to uh, Wednesday the 16th. And uh, the sun, as it travels, uh, will enter a constellation that's both ecliptical mm -hmm, and equatorial. Well, well, about that. This is Aquarius the water bearer. And so it means that Aquarius is part of the ecliptical set of constellations. Some refer to it as the zodiac, but I don't, and I don't encourage that because that's based on astrology, which is a false, false based uh, uh, belief system. And so we refer to it as ecliptical uh, on that way. And equatorial means that the area of the constellation Aquarius straddles the equator. Part of it's in the northern hemisphere, the other part's in the southern hemisphere. And there on the 16th also, notice back up on the, pay, the line the week prior, on Tuesday the 8th, we had a first quarter and it was a waxing gibbous phase. And so from the 8th all the way to the 16th, to that time on uh, Wednesday the 16th <clears throat> at 10.57 in the morning, we do have a full moon at that time. And we quit waxing gibbous. We now do waning gibbous. I did not explain to you what gibbous means. Gibbous is a Latin term that means hump, H-U-M-P. Think of a hump on the back of a camel. And uh, that's the idea of it. It's an old Latin term. Also, waxing and waning is an old English a uh, literary or vocabulary term, waxing there on Tuesday the 8th, means that something is gaining in strength. The uh, common thing would say, so-and-so waxed eloquently in his or her speech. And then we go to the 16th and we see waning, which is the opposite. 
you are losing strength. So unfortunately, the person who gave the speech did it so much that his health waned after that. Then we have uh, on Thursday the 17th, the planet Mercury is at five, uh, early in the morning, 547. It says it's at its westernmost elongation. And I put under there, it leads the sun. So if you, uh, uh, Mercury rises above the eastern horizon at 547 in the morning, and you will be able to see it up until sunrise, of course, and then you will lose the uh, ability being able to see it in the sky. And uh, that's what that is referring to. Let's go to our second page and our next line of uh, the week. And uh, nothing from uh, Friday on through Monday. And then we have on Tuesday, oh, another constellation. And this is Vela. And let's go to Vela, if you would, Cindy. Thank you. And notice again, this is about one of the three on the ship Argo Navis. And these are its sails that we have here. Now, now let's scroll down just a little bit, not too much. And you notice way at the top, there is the Tropic of Capricorn. And I mentioned for you, still, that's at minus 23.44 south. But we go on further south to get to Vela. And below Vela, there is our southern horizon. So we can see all of Vela. And I included there, connecting to Vela, there is our red, our false cross. And red means stop, quit using that to navigate with. That's the idea. And if you look to your left in the bottom left corner of the chart, there is a green cross. Oh, green means go, go ahead, use it. That is crux, the constellation, which means cross. And it points pretty well, that vertical beam of it, if you want, points to toward the, where the South Pole would be in the sky. Notice also where the uh, Southern Horizon line goes through. And we can see the top part of the Southern Cross. And the, as we're looking at it, the right hand star there. But the other two are too far south and we cannot see them. Now let's go on down to the uh, information page and scroll on through. And we'll see, and I have there for you uh, adding for more information. Uh, uh, to remind you that what you see on that page, there's the false cross. Do not use it. Uh, go ahead and identify it, but don't use it for determining direction. And then the, the third line there, the constellation crux is your correct uh, cross to navigate with. All right, Cindy, let's go back. Let's take a look in the calendar. What is coming up next? Well, we got uh, here on Wednesday the 23rd, and let's see what that might be. Well, it's our next uh, tour, if you will. Uh, the next, what do you call it, Cindy? WebEx, or what do you, how do you call it? We, we, we call these our virtual night sky tours. Okay. And yeah, so we're different than what Warren does over at the Mayborn Science Theater. Yes. And uh, maybe something is ki kind of uh, interesting in all of you who are watching this, your mind. Uh, what is today? Today is Wednesday the what? The 26th of January. Isn't that correct? 
I and don't know. it yes. should be. <laughs> it it happens yes. to be the last Saturday of the month of January. Well, what is the 23rd of February? It's the last Saturday of February. So, when are you going to be seeing all of our virtual tours of the night sky? When is it going to be, Cindy? Oh, it's going to be. You totally confused me. <laughs> all right. Our next night. Oh, my gosh. It, okay, I'm totally confused. Our next one, if you look under our library website, our library events calendar, or you can just, you know, go to our page and go under events. It will there show you, back, right, back our night yeah. sky tours, and they're all on a Wednesday. Um, we managed to get them all on the same day uh, each yeah. month. Mm -hmm. And it's the last Saturday of each month. Notice uh, we had two in January, and that was because we could not do it during the uh, Christmas, New Year's time period. So uh, earlier this month, we did the, the one for January 5th was for the January tour. But here we're back on schedule. This Wednesday, the February 26th, is the Mar uh, the February tour. What I say, when's January the 26th? <laughs> yeah, we're February 23rd, and then you do your your um, in person ones on a Saturday. Right, which is also yeah. the last Saturday of the month. So the last Wednesday of the month is the virtual tour. And the last Saturday of the month is the planetarium uh, tour, uh, as you see over there on that page. And also on Saturday the 26th, we have our uh, perigee moon, and there you see. And it's also uh, I uh, in red there that there are 14 perigee moons uh, this year, which is rare, which means there are two months that will have two perigees. Now, if you only had it once a month, you'd only have 12, but pretty well, very common, one of the months each year will have two. So there's usually 13 perigees and 13 apogees, but having 14 is a little added difference that's there. And then, as Cindy said, uh, then at 5.30, I, over at the planetarium for an hour, I do the planetarium tour, and it is going to be next month. And that's the same back there on Wednesday the 23rd. I'll be talking, giving you the virtual tour of March also, the March calendar. Well, and, and I also want to add that there's nothing like being in that planetarium because you get a chance to see the stars that Warren talks about um, that may not be so great above us and clean. Um, you know, if you got to go like further out where it's it's not as light, but being in that dome, you can see everything, right, Warren? Yes, uh, very much so, and you can also get the relationship of where it is, where something is in relation to another uh, in there, and we can also uh, throw the switch and we can bring up at that time, we can bring up the planets, so you can see about that and the moon, and uh, if it was uh, daytime, but then whatever, we can also do the sun. So anyway, uh, on uh, the Wednesday the 23rd there, at the very bottom of the t Wednesday, we have the third quarter moon. Most, notice we go from the full moon and it changed just below above there. Scroll down just a touch there, Cindy, uh, for us there, right there. 
notice uh, that the we have at uh, no the other direction. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Uh, there you go. There's the full moon, and at the full moon, then it started its waning gibbous phase, and then we come to the third quarter moon. It continues to wane, but it's a waning crescent phase. So we've gone from gibbous hump to a crescent in the sky, and it's going to continue getting, uh, seeing less and less illuminated part of the moon until we're going to get to something else that you're going to see down here in a little bit. Okay, let's scroll down to the last week. And in our last week on Monday the 28th, the end of the month, we have our last constellation called Antlia, the air pump. And that uh, astronomer, Lakail, who was sent down to South Africa to, if you will, uh, determine and map out the Southern Hemisphere sky, and he was trying to think of things to fill it up with. And so he just came up with triangle, air pump, you know, different things like that. And so uh, different. Okay, so let's take a look at Antlia, if you would, please. And here's Antlia. And in relationship, uh, it's below, if further south than the Tropic of Capricorn. But as we scroll down a little bit, we're going to see, well, our southern horizon is not even on the chart. So we should be able to see it. And if you then go down to, if you will, to the second page, since there's no latitude page for it, and we see there's nothing else. There's the information on the Tropic of Cancer. And let's look at that last thing. To view all of constellation Antlia, you must be at, well, 4939 North. Well, we're down at 31. So that's why we can see all of it. Let's go to the calendar. If you will, please, Cindy. And uh, I put on there for you on March the 1st, and we'll point that out again in there. But on that's an excellent morning to view these three things. They're going to be very close to each other. Planet Mercury will rise first at 555 in the morning. And in just a few minutes and three minutes, Saturn rises and they are only 1.65 degrees apart. If you hold your hand out in front of you and your your uh, take your fingers, your little finger uh, holding it up as you hold it out is approximately one degree across. So you're going to see they are very close to each other. But as far as what we see, of course, in distance, uh, from uh, Earth, they are very much different than that. Then as planet Saturn, and it goes and it says, what? It's eight degrees from the moon. And so uh, it's going to take a little longer there, 38 minutes. And then here comes the moon and it's uh, eight degrees from Saturn and another two degrees thereabouts from Mercury. You got all that, and uh, that rises at 636. And then it says that on the other side, the direction looking uh, on down toward the horizon, we got another almost 17 degrees until we get to the sun, which comes up at 658. So that'll be a busy morning for you to look on that day. And then you have the other things that we have. Now, in our last uh, few minutes here, there's something I want to uh, share with you. And I've asked Cindy to post up the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. 
And the reason for that is this, I want to talk about this blue uh, section that I have up at the very top. And you'll see that Ursa Major, <clears throat> being a very far northern uh, constellation, it is far enough that uh, it comes up to what we would call, uh, we will have some circumpolar uh, region there. Now, what does that mean? Let's take a look here real quick at it. Look at it, that whole, see the blue dash dotted line, everything from there to the North Pole is what we call circumpolar. And then the line, the blue line there, is our northern horizon. Now, to help you get a better understanding of that, I have a another section where I want to quickly go through, and Cindy's going to bring it up here. And here is a chart looking down on the North Pole. Uh, there's Polaris at the very, uh, virtually almost the center. And that red circle dashed line is our northern circumpolar polar area. Take circumpolar, break it apart, and you get circumference around. So that and polar means this is an area around the pole, the North Pole. What that means is then everything from, and that red line is our northern horizon throughout the, throughout the day and throughout the night. And uh, everything what you see in that area will, all, will be above the northern horizon and you will be able to see it every night of the year in there. So, but that's that. Now we have a southern. So let's go to the second page, if you will, please, and scroll down. There's the southern for us. And similar to it, since we, where we are, there's a section in the sky when we look to the south that we cannot see. And the red line there is our southern horizon. So everything from there to the South Pole, we will never see unless we go down south. To help you get a better understanding, we're going to do this. I want to take you all, and let's go to the next page. We're going to go down to Brownsville, right there. And Brownsville is uh, about 26 degrees uh, north. And this is its northern circumpolar area. Every, every latitude has one. And here it is here. And you say, well, OK, Warren, what's the big difference between that? Well, Cindy, go to the next page and compare. Whoops, look at there. There's planetarium. It's a little bigger. Go back, down, uh, back up to Brownsville. Notice the difference? The further south you go, your northern circumpolar is smaller. You see that? Brownsville's circumpolar region is smaller than, go to the next page, than our region. And let's go on north. Let's go up to Amarillo. So let's scroll up and, wow. Look at there, it's getting bigger. And scroll back down uh, to compare to CTCs on the, the previous page and see it's a little bit different. And then back up to Amarillo. There we go. And so the further south you get, or pardon me, the further north you get, you get more circumpolar area. See, I've written in for you there. I say that Amarillo, and I just gave a close latitude of 36 degrees north. In your mind, see the horizontal line, the uh, dark line across the center of uh, all the circles? That is where Polaris would be. 
and from there hanging down if you want to say that down to the red uh, circle that is 36 degrees and you have going from polaris up that's still 36 degrees and so in a sense we're looking over the north pole when we uh, would look to the north uh, for our circumpolar area. So let's go on and we're now going to do, let's go uh, to see here, and we're going to see Amarillo's southern circumpolar area. Remember, CTC, I showed you we have a circumpolar southern area. And let me ask you, we are at Amarillo, we are north of CTC. So if we go north, can we see more of the northern area? Yes. So everything inside that is uh, for uh, for them. Uh, that means the southern circumpolar area for uh, Amarillo is actually going to be larger because we've moved away from the South Pole. And look at that. Let's go to the next page, Cindy. Notice, and there are CTCs. See the comparison between the two? And you can scroll back up and there's Amarillo. See how much bigger? Because it's further north, that's less of the South you can see. And we go down to see uh, Central Texas and uh, here at the college, and we have less that we can see to the south. Well, what would you think about the southern for Brownsville? Let's go on down to Brownsville. Oh, because we have gone further south, we have we can see more of the southern uh, part of the sky. And if we would go on down into uh, Mexico, Central America, the northern part of South America, that circle there is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to the equator and everything is uh, only right here. There is no circumpolar as far as that because we are at the equator and both poles, if you look to the north, the north pole would be to the north on the horizon. You look to the south, the south pole would be on the southern horizon. There's no circumpolar. So I hope this kind of gives you an understanding. This will be posted on uh, the lip guide uh, there section. And you can tell them, Cindy, as we wrap up here, where that would be. It's right here under our additional astronomy documents. So that's where we have that one. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I got us coming up at one o'clock. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Always, I learned so many new things and I find myself always looking up at the sky. There um, you go. Good. I, I wanted to let to remind you guys of a few of our um, upcoming events. Next Monday, we have International Day of Commemoration in Memory of the Victims of the Holocaust with um, Dr. Kenneth Bass. He will be talking to us about the history of the Holocaust. It will be here on Facebook at noon. Then next Tuesday, we are going to be joining the agricultural department um, over at the CTC greenhouse for a seed swap from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. Bring seeds. If you've got leftover seeds or bulbs, um, go to the greenhouse and um, we have some seeds that we can swap with you. And as the time progresses, we'll get more and more different kinds of seeds and you just come and swap them. And at that point, 
you can build amazing new things in your garden and you can share some amazing things that you have in your own garden with others. So it'll be a lot of fun and it's next Wednesday. I said Tuesday. It's next Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then we have another another um, in-person event and that's next Thursday, and it'll be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the library. We have local authors that, a local published authors that are going to be reading from their books, and it's a mixture, uh, adult fiction, children's fiction, uh, nonfiction, poetry, um, just lots of great talent, and after they read, they're going to uh, be at their tables with their books if you want to purchase it or get some uh, autographs. We are going to be live streaming um, on Facebook the reading part of it. But if you want to meet the authors in person, make sure that you show up that evening. It's free of charge, as is all of our events. And so we hope to see you there. Uh, each week, February is just, as Warren would say, chock full of activities and so make sure that you um go to our events page on our library website and check out to see what we have every week okay all righty well warren thank you again for everything um we we really enjoy going ahead and uh talking to you about what's out in the sky you are a true astronomer well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to mention about KNCT? Oh, yes. KNCT also um, is doing, you talk about it because I know you have a regular set, set over there as well. Don't you? No, we don't. No. <laughs> well, we, we actually partner with KNCT and they're some great partners with us too. And so we share our information with them. We share our programming with them. They have, um, they have some regular program at KNCT. Um, and so, you know, together between our radio station, the Mayborn Science Theater, the library, we love to partner all over the place because then we reach so many people in our community and outside of our community. But to be honest, CTC is global. So the earth is our community. We have students everywhere. So, um, and that's what we love to reach everyone. Um, now you might want to ask Warren about, you know, not on earth because he would be the one to tell you if there's somebody out there that's also watching right <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah he would be the go-to person for anything outside of the earth <laughs> there you go so all righty well warren thank you again for um uh visiting with us and we will see you uh later on next month and yes, indeed. we will have our next virtual night sky tour. Thank you again for um, visiting with us. And thank you guys, everyone, for visiting with us. And we will see you next month. And I will see you next Monday. <laughs> have a great, a great day. Thank you. And thank you, Alyssa. It's time you can take us out.